Hello there, folks, and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Global Summit 12 presentation of COVID-19, the paths forward for parents, educators, and public health experts. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the vice president at the JES. In this program, which originally aired live on Friday, May 21st, 2021, the JES Global Summit chairman, Steve Scully, interviews Dr. Lena Wen, Washington Post columnist and CNN medical analyst about the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get to the program, I'd like to thank all of our event sponsors, Erie Insurance, Erie News Now, the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, WQLN Public Media, and the American Tapestry Project, and our Global Summit event partner, the City Club of Cleveland. And I'd like to remind you that you can access additional programs to be streamed on demand at jeserie.org, where you'll find a wide range of publications from reports, essays, timely writings, and more. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all JES content. And now, Here's COVID-19, the path forward for parents, educators, and public health experts. Thank you, Ben, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you, and I am beyond thrilled to welcome Dr. Lena Wen. She is, of course, a familiar figure. If you watch CNN, she's an emergency room doctor, a physician, a Rhodes Scholar, a writer, and I think her best title is she's a mom. She's a delightful person involved in so many different organizations, the Baltimore Community Foundation, the Bipartisan Policy Center, serving on a number of advisory boards. She is a Rhodes Scholar. She now teaches at George Washington University. And she's out with a new book this July called Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. She's also a contributor to the Washington Post. You can read her many columns online at WashingtonPost.com, and I consider her a good friend. So Dr. Wen, on behalf of the citizens of Erie in Northwest Pennsylvania, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you, and in particular, in conversation with you as someone, as a journalist who is really second to none and one of my favorite people in the world. Thank you, and it's mutual. Let me just begin with kind of a, a status question. Where are we right now with COVID-19? Well, um, I've been saying for um, quite some time that we have a mixed picture. I actually think that in many ways we have gotten past that. And I actually think that I'm here to be able to give good news on so many different fronts. When we look at the daily new infections for coronavirus, we are at the lowest that we've been since last spring. And when you look at the curve for where we're headed, it looks like just as back during the winter, we were in the phase of exponential growth. I actually think that we're now in the phase of exponential decline, which is really incredible. I mean, we're now seeing that more than 60% of adults in America have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. That has everything to do with where we are, declining deaths, declining hospitalizations, declining new infections. Um, all this is fantastic. And of course, the great news that 12 to 15 year olds can also be vaccinated. We're now seeing that um, well over a, uh, a million people in that age group are vaccinated too. So again, I think there's great news throughout. But I will also say that, and I'm, I hope we can talk more about this, I was very troubled by the CDC's abrupt and really, I think, misguided change in guidelines last week. Um, and I think that this has the potential to cause a lot of not only confusion, but actually to set us back in the progress that we made thus far, because in their attempt to try to um, tell people about the benefits of vaccination and look, it's wonderful that fully vaccinated people are generally safe. I think that's been misinterpreted as we have gotten to the point in the pandemic where we no longer need mask mandates. And I just don't think that that's true in many places in the country. And I do fear that there is the potential, especially in places where the vaccination rates are still pretty low. We could see localized outbreaks that don't get controlled, that could lead to more variants potentially developing, that could really set back the progress that we made. Well, you used two words, abrupt, and you also mentioned the, uh, the mixed messages from the CDC. Why? And it seemed to happen literally within an hour after earlier in the day, they're saying wear masks. And then all of a sudden they're saying you don't need to wear them if you've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Yeah, I think the messaging was really bad um, and the policy was was poor. Here's what I think the CDC was trying to do. And let me give them a lot of credit here. The CDC got the science of it all correct. And I think that they were trying to do a good thing, which was to say, 
Look, we want to share the great news that we now have overwhelming evidence that the COVID-19 vaccines that we have protect you very well from getting infected, from becoming severely ill. They are effective against the variants. And also, very importantly, there's accumulating evidence that getting the vaccine also substantially reduces your risk of being a carrier who could transmit COVID-19 to others. So again, great that they want to spread this message. I wish that they had stuck to that. If they had simply said, here's what we know about the vaccines, here's great news, and fully vaccinated people can be around other fully vaccinated people without restriction, including in workplaces, including in theaters and other large settings. If they had stuck to that, we would not be in the situation now. If the of course, you certainly know about this as the director of public health in the city of Baltimore. So many questions for parents, and I'm going to encourage those parents in particular to send the questions to Ben, and he will forward them to me. Questions about summer camp, vacations, do we go to Disney World, and then what the fall will look like after a year of virtual classrooms in most parts of the country. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of questions for parents, but if I may just go back for a minute to, I think, what happened with the CDC, because I think it's relevant to sure. the rest of our conversation. The CDC was behaving like an individual doctor, talking to an individual patient. If I'm talking to my patients about guidance for them as individuals, I would certainly tell them, if you're fully vaccinated, you are very well protected. Therefore, you can decide what level of risk you would want to partake in. So if you want to go to a restaurant, if you want to go traveling, you understand that there's low risk, but it's still, it's not zero risk. There's still a low risk of you becoming ill, low risk of you transmitting to others, but you're welcome to choose that risk for yourself. I think, again, the CDC was speaking like a doctor to a patient, but they, as a public health entity, have a wider responsibility, which public health is about communities, it's about society. And I think because there wasn't proof of vaccination that was requested, my concern is that now we have vaccinated people and unvaccinated people all taking off their masks in public places. And to your question specifically about children and, um, and, 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 and parents of young kids who cannot yet be vaccinated, I think that we are now in a situation where at least for a period of time, while community transmission is still pretty high, we have actually just made life harder and riskier for children. Because, for example, with my kids, if I'm, I have a one year old and a three and a half year old, um, if I'm taking them to the grocery store and now people around us are not wearing masks, I have no way of knowing whether the people around us are vaccinated or not. And actually, children now constitute 24 percent of all the new COVID infections. And so I, um, I'm happy to answer specific questions about kids and guidance. But I actually think that right now for this, there is a period of time of weeks, hopefully, um, but just of weeks where I would actually be really careful about taking our children to indoor public places. What about the new vaccine for those children between 12 and 16? How significant is that? Is it a game changer? I think it is. I mean, previously, the Pfizer vaccine was authorized for individuals 16 and older. The new guidance or the new authorization extends it now to 12 to 15 year olds. That's a group of nearly 17 million people. And so it is certainly a game changer to this group of individuals, also to their parents. A lot of families have been wondering, what do we do if we are partially vaccinated, if the parents are vaccinated, but kids are not? I think that um, will settle the issue if everybody in the family is vaccinated. Also, I, I mean, I, I know of so many kids in this range who are eager to get back to their pre-pandemic lives, who are so eager to get vaccinated so they can do sleepovers, they can go shopping with their friends, they can resume so many things that they didn't have a chance to. We have talked so often in this last year, and I remember a conversation we had back in the early stages of COVID-19, and the questions that I had asked and others were asking you, when will we get a vaccine? Could it come within a year? It did. My question for you, how significant is that Operation Warp Speed? Yeah, and here I think it's really important that we give the Trump administration a lot of credit and, of course, the scientists globally who took part in this effort. I mean, it is, it's actually unimaginable. If you had told us back in 
June of 2020. I mean, you and I, Steve, had multiple conversations over the course of 2020, and I could not have imagined, and I don't think that any of us as scientists could have imagined, not only that we would have these vaccines, but that we would have such effective vaccines. I think a lot of us might have expected and were ready for something that was like the flu vaccine, you know, 40 to 60 percent effective, definitely still protective and you should take it. But the messaging was a lot harder because if there were something that's only 60 percent effective, we might have to tell people, get the vaccine, still keep up all these precautions, still wear masks. And it, it would have been a lot harder than I think the message is now, which is essentially once you're vaccinated, you can take off your mask, you can stop distancing, you can go back to doing the things you did pre pandemic. And so I think the Trump administration should get a lot of credit for helping to expedite that process, investing in the science, um, purchasing also many doses of the vaccine in advance so that they are de-risking pharmaceutical companies. I think there's a lot that they did right, um, a lot that they did wrong, but this is one of those things that I think they should get the credit for. Well, let me take that one step further. Can we apply that to other illnesses, this sense of a private-public partnership, the government taking the financial risk out of Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, when it comes to other health issues, whether it's diabetes or cancer, that they can apply this to those causes, to those illnesses and issues? I think there are some people who would argue that they already do that to a large extent because of, of federal funding of the NIH and federal funding of so many um, in early stage developments in science that then pharmaceutical companies build upon for, for their research. Um, I do see your point overall about could, could we in the future expedite um, scientific developments. I think there are other things that we could do. The regulatory process for for um, for drugs certainly is something that um, uh, drugs and devices is something that um, that some would say is too slow and cumbersome. So I think that's something that we would look to the new FDA leadership once that's once that's finalized um, to be able to help expedite. And as you know, Pfizer and Moderna CEOs uh, telling a number of news organizations expect a booster shot in the fall or winter. Why is that? So I have a rather cynical view of, of, of the direct answer to your question of why are they telling people that? That's different from a scientific answer. And I'll tell you both here if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, the, I think the direct answer for why they're doing this, they talked about this on their investor calls. They are projecting that there will be booster shots. They were speaking to their stake, to their shareholders, and to their investors in this. So I think you know my cynical answer is that's the very specific reason and the answer to your question. But I think there's a scientific answer here too. So here's what we know: we know that the vaccines that we have are they are very effective um, at six months. We don't know much further beyond that because the vaccines have not been studied for long enough for us to say they're effective after a year. We just don't know that. There's no reason though, based on the science that we have to believe that we will need a booster shot in nine months or in 12 months. It may be that you need a booster shot in two years or three years. Why might one need a booster shot? One is if the immunity wanes over time. Two is if there are variants that develop to which the vaccines that we have may not be as effective. Again, right now, we have no evidence to either of these two points. And so I think it's premature to talk about a booster in nine or 12 months. Here's the other reason why I, I am particularly sensitive to talking about boosters. There are some people who will, look at, who will look at the idea of a booster and say, what's the big deal? I get a flu shot every year. Some other people will, will actually be knocking down the door of their doctor's office if a booster is available, who will say, if something has 90% efficacy now and you can get me to 100% efficacy, give me that shot right now. So there are some people who are very eager. There are others, though, we know from focus groups. There are actually other people for whom, if you say that there is the possibility of a booster, it's actually a major deterrent for them to get the vaccine in the first place. One of the most commonly cited reasons for those who are on the fence about vaccination is the idea of a booster, which again, for people who are who will get it tomorrow, don't understand that. But their reason, the vaccine hesitant reason is, 
what's the point of getting a shot now if I have to get one later anyway? This pandemic is never going to be over, so what's the point? We may disagree with that viewpoint, but I think it's important for us to recognize how prevalent it is and therefore just be very careful about um, about how we are, um, how we are, uh, sorry, my no went to Dr. Fauci, uh, but we should just be very careful about how, um, how careful or how um, uh, the impact of our, of our words. I'm going to ask you what is a impossible question, but if you could go back to January and February of last year with the very first reports of COVID-19, what do you think public health experts in this country and elsewhere in the world could have or should have done differently? I think there have been a lot of um, retrospectives and um, and investigations that have been done and should continue to. In my viewpoint, if we have the perspective of hindsight, here's what we should have done. One is we should have recognized at the very beginning that we were missing so many cases because we were essentially flying blind. Without data, we were flying blind. We were looking specifically, for example, at individuals coming in from Wuhan without looking at the rest of China. We were looking at China without looking at Europe, um, where many of where the it, it now appears that the um, the large outbreak um, that occurred in the catastrophe in New York City actually came from Europe. We also missed so many cases of community transmission that were occurring right in our backyard. And I heard someone refer to this as we closed the front door without realizing that the back door was open and in fact that the burglars were already in the house robbing us. I mean, we really didn't realize that as a country we had a giant problem until we reached exponential spread and we had this huge issue across our country. So I think lack of data, lack of testing, our um, our total, um, our having blinders on and not recognizing what was going on certainly was a big part of this. I think another um, lesson that we learned is that we never had a coherent national strategy. And you know what? I would still argue that we don't have a coherent national strategy. Um, the, in the beginning, there were a lot of people who were talking about flattening the curve, meaning that we don't want our hospitals all to be overwhelmed at the same time. I was one of those talking about this too. Um, and, and yes, that was really important, but was that our strategy? I mean, was the end goal simply to say we don't want our hospitals to be overrun or was actually our end goal to try to eliminate COVID or was it to try to live with COVID but at a low enough level that our ICUs don't get overwhelmed? I mean, what was the reason? What was our goal here? We never really established that. States were all doing different things. There was no central coordinated response. And again, I'm perhaps being a little bit picky here, but uh, we're still, um, we're, we're still, I, I would argue it's still not entirely clear to me what our national strategy is. Is our national strategy at this point, is it living with a certain level of infection, recognizing that we have to get our economy back and things back to normal? Is it actually trying to reach herd immunity? I mean, what is our strategy? It's not clear. And I think that certainly held us back. And I'll just name one more thing, which sure. is that in looking back, we have really seen what happens when we do not invest in public health. Public health is about prevention. Public health is about preventing something from happening. And therefore, it's very hard to put the face of public health when something is by definition invisible. You don't invest in it. It becomes the first thing on the chopping block. And actually, you were very kind to mention my, my book earlier, Steve, and I wrote my the, the book, Lifelines, in part to celebrate public health and to illustrate how an investment in public health certainly would have prevented something like what we're seeing with COVID, but also it's critical to so many other issues that we care about, like mental health and the opioid epidemic and trauma and childhood um, immunizations and lead poisoning and so many other elements of people's lives too. Well, a good opportunity for me not only to talk about the book, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health, but also your own journey, which is really an incredible personal story if you could share that. Well, um, I appreciate the, the question and and happy to um, happy to give you a teaser about this. My um, I recently um, talked to my publisher at at Macmillan about about the book, and they said you should try to not give away too much of the book. Give a teaser, but not too much. And I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure exactly how how people do that. But um, no, I mean, I actually I wrote the book um, 
initially it was really only meant to celebrate the work that so many different people were doing in Baltimore. Um, I saw coming out of the unrest that followed the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore that a lot of people, including the media, wanted to portray Baltimore in a certain light. And it may have helped whatever narrative to show the pictures of cars burning and teens throwing things and, um, and setting things on fire. But that was not the picture of Baltimore that I saw. And I wanted to show the work that frontline individuals, nonprofit organizations, churches, all these people are doing every day to build our city from a public health lens. And I wanted to show how when public health works really well, what it's able to do and how much it's integral to everything, education, violence prevention, jobs, et cetera. And of course, of writing the book, my publisher also really wanted me to write my personal story, which in many ways is a story of public health as well, because I'm an immigrant. I came to the US just before I turned eight. My parents worked multiple jobs to try to make ends meet, but we still at times went through some very difficult periods. Um, and in many ways, public health was our safety net. So in the book, I also talk about how for our family, um, public health saved us and how that then also got me to pursue a, a career in public health um, and my experiences working in the ER. I mean, it, I never, you know, it's not like I woke up one day in college and said, I'm going to go into public health. I actually came to understand this field through the lens of being in the ER and recognizing how much of our um, healthcare problems don't come from the hospital and aren't solved from the hospital, but actually need a public health solution. Well, it is an incredible journey and really an American success story for the work that you've done and the ability to give back on so many different levels, whether in your community of Baltimore or through your contributions in the media, what you're doing here today, just telling the story about what you do and how important that is. So thank you. Um, let me go back to flu season and COVID-19. As we approach the fall and winter, how do public health experts deal with that? Because one of the things Dr. Fauci indicated is that we had a very low rate of flu influenza this, this last year because people were home, they were wearing a mask. That may not be the case in the winter of 2020, 2021. So how do you address that? Tell me more about what, what, what you mean. In terms of the flu season this last year was very low because people were isolated, they were wearing masks, they were in the workplace. As we go back into the workplace this fall and winter and we have the flu and potentially still some remnants of COVID-19, do we get two different shots? How do public health experts deal with influenza and coronavirus? Yeah, I think this this one is going to be very challenging and even not just influenza, but any respiratory pathogen. Um, in the past, if in previous years, not this last winter, but previous years, if someone had a runny nose and a fever and a cough and is otherwise generally healthy and they're not going to be hospitalized, we wouldn't test them because there's no point. I mean, we don't test to see what what exact other thing is, what viral, what virus is causing your symptoms. We diagnose you with a viral infection and you go home. You probably don't even call the doctor because we get sniffles and colds um, every so often. It's gonna be challenging this winter. Last winter, in a way simpler because people were still distancing and as you said, Steve, not going back to work in school for, for, for the most part, but now, I think we're going to have to have a lot of conversations about who do we test? I mean, do we test every individual, even if they're vaccinated, come this fall for everything? If Do we do a flu test first? And if it's negative, do we then do COVID? Do we do both tests at the same time? I think there's going to be a lot of conversation around that. I really hope that by then we're able to develop outpatient oral treatment for coronavirus as well. That's something that actually I don't think we've talked about as much, which is what about people who are mildly sick from coronavirus? 
can we prevent them from becoming severely ill? Right now, there is an infusion that you can take, but the infusion is not easy. I mean, you have to go into the hospital and get an IV infusion, and only certain people qualify for that. Think about Tamiflu for the flu. If you get influenza, you get you take Tamiflu that reduces the duration and severity of your symptoms. Your close contacts at home take Tamiflu to prevent from getting influenza, even if they have already been vaccinated. I would love to see that being developed for COVID-19. I hope that's, that that's something that, that comes to. I think your question, though, Steve, also brings to mind a, another question, which is about masking and whether people are going to be wearing masks in offices or other spaces this fall, uh, this, um, fall and winter season. I suspect that some people are going to are going to say, hey, I never thought I, this is not that uncomfortable for me. And I never thought that I could prevent from getting so many illnesses in the winter. Why don't I do this? I suspect that others are going to have a very different reaction, though. Um, because and, because uh, that's quite common one. across Asia. That's right. But I would say, too, that in Asian countries, there has been for a long time a mask wearing culture, one that we don't have here. So I, I am curious to see how much people adopt that as a pattern going forward. A lot of questions coming in, including one from a viewer wondering about whether or not if we had a national health care system, would that have allowed us to better respond, better handle the early stages of COVID-19? Well, you know, I am not a proponent of Medicare for all. Um, and so I, of course, I'm not going to give maybe a favor. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure that I'm going to give the answer that that all of you would want me to, to, uh, to, to give in, in this regard. I will say that we, um, I, I'll say here's how I think a, um, here's how other countries have handled this that have national health systems that have benefits that we could learn from. One of the reasons why Israel and the UK were so quick at vaccination is that they had systems in place where they could track everybody and track people who were not getting vaccinated. And so through the National Health Service in the UK and Israel also has four major health insurers that everybody belongs to. And so they were able to track all the vulnerable older individuals. They were able to do vaccine rollout in a way that really made a lot more sense because people could um, people could be scheduled immediately. They could be followed up with. There's not this haphazard. Everybody tries to sign up, but the healthy 30 year old is signing up at the same time as a, a 80 year old with medical problems. And so it's, you know, I think a national system could certainly help in that regard and would definitely be of help if we're if we're thinking about some type of, of verification of vaccination. Early on in the pandemic, though, I don't think that having some kind of national health health system would have made much of a difference. Early on in the pandemic, we were dealing with lack of testing, which was actually the CDC really had some errors in that in that part with 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 testing and recognition of the importance of testing. Um, then there were issues with hospital capacity, but hospitals were coordinating among themselves. And I don't know that that was a major problem. I actually think that a much bigger problem is the lack of a public health infrastructure. Again, it's not just the healthcare system and the health care that people receive, but who is available to set up testing? Who can do contact tracing? What is what what kind of facilities do we have for quarantining and isolation? Um, how can we then make sure when vaccine rollout was started that the same people who are doing testing weren't being pulled in every direction and now can't do testing and vaccination at the same time? I actually think that was a much bigger problem. As Dr. Ferrari mentioned before we were live for this program, there are a number of leading colleges and universities in Northwest Pennsylvania, Gannon, Mercyhurst, Edinburgh, which is a state university, Penn State Barron, which is a satellite campus of Penn State, uh, and of course, public and private uh, elementary and secondary schools. And so one of the questions, should schools at any level require students to have a vaccine? It's a great question. Um, I think that it is a very good idea to have vaccine requirements in schools. There are now, as of last count, over 200 colleges and universities that have a vaccine requirement. Um, and you know what? There are exemptions. And there are, I think, as long as there is a way for people to opt out, that also has the same result. As in, for example, if a university says you have two options, you can show proof of vaccination 
or you have to be tested twice a week and do a symptom questionnaire every day. That gives people a choice. And it also is, it clearly is incentivizing vaccination because testing twice a week is, is a big burden and filling out a symptom questionnaire every day, maybe not, not everybody wants to do that. But if for whatever reason you don't want to be vaccinated, you can do that other thing. Ultimately, these are places that want to go back to pre-pandemic normal, and they also want to keep their students and staff safe. So I think that um, certainly for colleges, a great idea. Younger populations, a bit harder because younger groups are not yet eligible under the age of 12 are not eligible. But I do think that, you know what, we, we mandate all kinds of other vaccines for kids to be in school. Why not this one too? Another question, you've written about this for the Washington Post. I'm afraid of vaccines. I'm afraid it's going to make me sick. For those fearful, you tell them what? Well, what I would say is we should address each person's individual concerns with empathy and compassion and not with judgment. And what I mean is I think that you know there are there's a tendency perhaps for those who are already vaccinated to view all those unvaccinated in the same bucket and say oh they're anti-vaxxers. There is a group of pretty hardcore anti-vaxxers who I don't know that we'll be able to change their minds. They might have some conspiracy theories. They might really have concerns about the government and other things that I don't know that we can change their minds on. But there are a lot of people who just have concerns. Maybe they haven't, maybe they also for them, it's a convenience issue. Um, we know that there are some people who are still worried about the cost of vaccines, even though they're free, but they're also worried about taking time off from work. And we should give, we should ideally give paid time off to get vaccinations and bring vaccines to workplaces. There are others who, as this questioner very well said, are just concerned that getting the vaccine could give them coronavirus. In which case I would say that's not possible because this vaccine does not contain a live virus. So just like with the flu vaccine, you're not going to get the flu from the flu vaccine. You're not going to get coronavirus from the coronavirus vaccine. Some other people have specific concerns related to side effects. I would say side effects are normal. They are expected. You could expect to get soreness in your arm, swelling in your arm. You could also expect to get fatigue, muscle aches overall, not feeling well. Those side effects fade. They will usually fade within two to three days maximum. There is no vaccine in the world in the hundreds of years that we've had vaccines where the side effects will last more than six weeks. And so for people who are concerned about long-term consequences of these vaccines, which I often hear about if these vaccines are new, how do we know there aren't long-term consequences? I would say, you know what? We don't know. We can't prove a negative, right? We can't prove mm -hmm. something that just literally hasn't happened. But we can tell you based on our experience with all the other vaccines that we have, polio, chickenpox, measles, mumps, tetanus, et cetera, there's no other vaccine for which there are side effects seen after six months. There's no reason for us to believe that side effects would persist, or uh, six weeks rather. There's no reason for us to believe that there would be side effects seen after six weeks for these vaccines either. Dr. Wen, let's turn our attention to treatments, whether it's from Desivere or other treatments for COVID-19. From your standpoint, what have we learned about the treatments and how will that allow us to deal with this pandemic or this virus, I should say, moving ahead? Well, we have learned a lot since the beginning of the pandemic with regard to treatment, especially for individuals with severe um, coronavirus infection. We know now that for individuals with severe infection um, that um, and, and are hospitalized, that postponing intubation and mechanical ventilation being put on a, on, on a ventilator is actually a good thing. Um, generally, in the past, when we saw patients coming in with oxygen saturations in the high 80s or low 80s even, we would say, oh my goodness, this patient needs additional help for their breathing and maybe be quicker to move them to ventilation. Now we know that we don't need to be doing this. And in fact, that, that um, postponing ventilation actually helps. Once individuals are ventilated, having them prone lying on their bellies instead of their bellies, uh, or um, lying on their bellies instead of their backs can also be of help as well. We also know that steroids and, and remdesivir, as you mentioned, are treatments that can be uh, of help in reducing the length of stay and, and reducing more, more mortality for individuals with severe COVID. 
Um, the area that we're really missing information is about outpatient treatment. Now there are some IV infusions of monoclonal antibodies that can reduce the, um, the likelihood of somebody progressing from mild to severe disease. Again, though, this requires IV infusion. Not every place has the capability to do this. You have to be in the hospital getting an infusion. We really need to get to the point that we get something like the equivalent of Tamiflu, an outpatient oral medication that somebody is able to take. I think that would be the real game changer. Excuse me. As you know, Pennsylvania is, I get choked up when I say Pennsylvania, <laughs> sorry. The, the state, the country is beginning to reopen. Uh, the restaurants in Erie beginning to, to reopen. Schools are gradually reopening. And yet we are seeing, witnessing really an explosion of cases in countries like India. My question is, are there lessons? Because India thought for a while they had contained the virus. That clearly was not the case. As you look at what's going on in that country and what we're dealing with today, not that there are parallels, but are there things that we should be concerned or learn from with regard to that country and where we're at today? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm so glad that we are talking about the, the global problems that there are because I am really concerned. I mean, from a humanitarian and ethical standpoint that there are so many countries that, for example, have not even received a drop of the vaccine for their healthcare workers, um, for and not, not to mention the elderly and the most vulnerable individuals in these countries. Um, I'm also worried about this from a self-interest per perspective for our country. We know that as long as there are there's virus raging in some parts of the world, the pandemic is not over and can certainly impact us here and make us less safe here as well. So I think that there are all kinds of reasons as to why we need to be um, watchful for what's going on around the world, why we have to do everything we can to increase vaccine production and distribution in these countries, including by scaling up manufacturing facilities in those other countries as well. In terms of lessons, I mean, I think that India and some other countries, they thought that they were in the clear. And as it turns out, they were not. And I think that this should be, if it's anything that we've learned in the course of this pandemic, it's how much we need to be humble in the face of this virus, that there are still unexpected turns that could occur that we may not even have anticipated yet. And so while we should celebrate our successes in the US and celebrate where we are, we have to be cognizant that other things could, could well happen and we need to be ready for it. A global death toll in excess of three and a half million, over 500,000 Americans. And as you look at the numbers here in this U.S., in the U.S., and this again goes back to your, your background as a public health expert, a disproportionate of those who have died are low-income minority individuals. Why? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question, Steve, because I think it's really important for us to talk about how, in the case of COVID-19, it's not the virus that's doing the discriminating. SARS-CoV-2 is not looking around and saying, I'm going to somehow disproportionately infect Black Americans, Latino Americans, and Native Americans. That's not what happened. What happened is a combination of things. One is, let's look at in my city in Baltimore. One in three African Americans live in a food desert compared to one in 12 whites. Is it any surprise that African Americans in our city have a higher burden of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, other things that are directly related to these structural problems and access to food? Then you have the fact that essential workers tend to be people of color who did not have the ability to physical distance and that those same communities tended to be multi-generational housing where if one person becomes ill, hard to do physical distancing, they might not even know that they're ill and they spread it to everybody else. And so I think for all those reasons, we saw the disproportionate toll in communities of color. We've also seen that these disparities don't go away on their own. And in fact, we're still seeing major issues with vaccine equity 
And again, why I'm so concerned about the CDC change in guidelines, because we have once again taken the legs out from from OSHA and from the ability of of um, of of workers to be protected who may not have had the opportunity to be vaccinated yet or may be immunocompromised and then don't get the full benefit of the vaccine. Now they're going to be exposed once again to unvaccinated, unmasked individuals who are putting their lives at risk. And so, again, I think that the disparities are so ever present in our system. We have to be very attentive to equity and to their credit, the Biden administration has actually done a phenomenal job of this. I just wish that they were even more attentive, um, especially given the change in CDC guidance now. Another question before I get to that, we learned this week, the European Union is basically saying, come to Europe, come to Spain and Portugal and Italy and, and France. This viewer wants to know whether or not it is safe to travel across the globe, to travel to a foreign country, perhaps to visit uh, the continent of Europe. It's a great question, and this is the way that I would answer it. Nothing at this point is zero risk. Nothing at this point is 100% risk. Everything is a gradation, it's a nuance, and all of this depends on how you would think about risk. So here's how I would think about it. Once vaccinated, your risk, unless you're somebody who is immunocompromised, your risk drops from high for many things to low for virtually everything. There are still some things that I think are going to be higher risk than others. So there is a degree of, of, of risk, but most things that were previously high risk are now low risk. I would put travel to Europe in that category. I think your, I think the chance of something, uh, the your risk of contracting coronavirus and getting ill from it are pretty low if you're an otherwise healthy person. The calculus changes depends on depending on what you want to do. If you are going to an area that has high coronavirus spread and you want to be going to nightclubs every night without masks, I mean, that's very different from if you want to visit some museums and spend time outdoors in parks and then go visit some friends. That's probably going to be much lower risk. I think the challenge is going to be with families, especially families with young kids. Uh, you know, that one I see as being again, dependent on people's individual values. I will tell you that for my family with two little kids, we don't feel comfortable with that just yet. Our kids are not yet vaccinated. Kids can become ill. Um, and I, I would not feel comfortable with a eight hour flight followed by um, who knows what kind of exposure they will have once they get to their destination. If my husband and I, if it were just the, the two of us, we would feel very comfortable with it. I was teasing Ben Spagan because as I looked at your biography, I said that he he missed one of the descriptions of you being a superwoman. Uh, I should add to that supermom, you had a baby in the early stages of this pandemic. And so on a personal level, I have to ask you, what was that like? Because you were working right up until you went into labor and then you're back to work shortly after delivery. It is true that I was working right, right up to the time that I was delivery. And, you know, I um, I, I gave birth in April of 2020, at the beginning of April of 2020. And actually, it was a pretty terrifying time because that was the time that hospitals were very quickly and dramatically changing their policies. I didn't know until the last minute whether my husband would be able to come with me during labor and delivery. He was able to eventually, but we didn't know. We also look back and at that time, we didn't really know about masking. I mean, the CDC had not come out with guidance about masking for asymptomatic people. We were in the hospital without the two of us wearing masks at that time, which was also kind of interesting that just how much we've, we've come in this period of time. Um, but, you know, I think having given birth during the pandemic and having a toddler as well, um, I think it gave me a lot of perspective of what so many people are going through who are working parents, um, who have, um, who are tending to other other things in our lives, who are caregivers to elderly parents. You know, I, I think that we have all gone through a really challenging period together. Um, I don't think that we have fully come to terms even with the level of trauma that we have all um, collectively and individually experienced. And I think it's going to take quite some time for us to emerge from this period. One other point to your own personal narrative and story, because as a mother of a one-year-old and a toddler, do you, how do you deal with coronavirus? What do you tell young mothers and fathers who have children your age that can't get the vaccine? Yeah, my advice to them is you should decide together as a family and then keep on evaluating your, your decision about what is your risk tolerance as a family. 
So here's what we know. We know that kids tend to get much less severely ill than adults do. That said, kids can and do become severely ill, um, and kids can get ill, period. I mean, we have now, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, 3.9 million children who have been infected by COVID-19. 24% um, of the new infections are in children. And we also know that um, over 300 kids have died from COVID-19, and thousands more are have suffered multi-system inflammatory syndrome, this, um, this potential you know, multi-organ um, uh, condition that may have long-lasting impacts on children. And so some people, some families are going to look at those data and say, I can take those risks. That seems pretty low risk. I want our kids to go back to everything that they did in the past. We want our family to go back to everything they did in the past. That's their choice. Other people are going to say, I want to hold on and be cautious for a bit longer. If my kids are 12 and older, I'll get them vaccinated. But if they're younger, I'm going to still be cautious. And so here's what, this is the, the approach that my family is taking. So here's what we will do. Our three and a half year old, he'll, he will have play dates outdoors without masks. Indoors, we try to limit his time if he's going to be around anybody else who's unvaccinated, including other children. If he's in that setting, we'll ask for him to wear masks and keep distancing while indoors. Um, he's going to summer camp when indoors they require masking. For us as parents, we know that our chance of contracting coronavirus and passing it on to our kids is very low, but not zero. So we are still going to be careful. We will do anything outdoors. We will do anything indoors if we know that people are fully vaccinated, but we are not going to go to maskless events with tons of crowd with, with tons of crowds. If I'm going to church and people are not masked, I'm still going to be wearing a mask. If I'm going to the grocery store and they're not checking for, for vaccination status and lots of people are unmasked, I'm definitely still going to be wearing a mask as well. So my 12 year old daughter will be at Camp Notre Dame, which is in Erie for a week in the summer. How do we know if the other kids have been vaccinated? Are we putting a, a preteen at risk if we agree to get our child vaccinated and other parents say, mm, I don't wanna do it? Well, I mean, if you decide to have your child vaccinated, your child is going to be well protected. Um, it's then your decision as to what you will have your child do when it comes to, for example, if your child is vaccinated, somebody else's child is vaccinated, they can have a sleepover together. Mm -hmm. But if your child is vaccinated, but they're not, it's up to you whether you think that risk is worth taking. And so I think that there are a lot of decisions along those lines that we'll be navigating. So let me kind of go back to where we began our conversation. And again, thank you on behalf of the Jefferson Education Society for, for spending time with us this afternoon. We had a chance to talk to Dr. Michael Sag from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And he basically said, look, COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while, five, six, eight years. I don't know, but we will have to, to manage this in one form or another. Vaccines, treatments, public health issues. So from your area of expertise, how do we manage COVID-19 moving forward with the assumption that 70 or maybe even 80% of Americans are vaccinated at some point later this year? I don't think we're going to get to 70 to 80% of, of Americans vaccinated. I just you don't? don't no. I mean, not it, it, we, we might get to 70% of adults vaccinated, but overall, especially when at right now, we can't get zero to 11 year olds vaccinated, I don't think there's any chance of us getting to. And actually, I meant I meant adults. So let me clarify that: 70 to 80 percent okay. of the adults. But, but the, the the bigger question is, how do we manage COVID nineteen moving forward? In the best case scenario, we will begin to think of this as we do the flu, as in some people are still going to get sick, some people will still get very severely ill and die. Most people, if they're generally healthy and they're vaccinated, will, will be fine. Um, I think that in time, that's how we will begin to see COVID as well. Now, I think some people are uncomfortable with the comparison with the flu because the flu is a respiratory pathogen that doesn't seem to affect all your other body systems the way that COVID does. And COVID causes long haul and other things that we really do not want either. Um, but I think that overall, we are going to have to learn to live with COVID. Everything changes, though, if there are variants that arise either here in the U.S. or in other countries that may make us more susceptible um, to um, or that may render the vaccines that we have um, less effective. And so I think that calculus also dramatically changes if that's the case. Two final points. First of all, the origins of COVID-19 
A lot of different stories out there. It came from a lab in Wuhan, China. From your research, what can you tell us about how this originated? I will tell you that I don't know. I have read the um, the arguments from different sides. And I think at this point, if anyone says they are certain, they would be outside of scientific bounds. I think one thing is for certain, which is that we really need to understand that the Chinese government needs to be a lot more transparent and forthcoming about participating in an international independent investigation. The World Health Organization needs to stop towing whatever line they've been towing and really do a thorough investigation that's unbiased. Um, we, we need to understand. It is really important to know how this happened so we can prevent further instances so we can also have the surveillance in place to prevent something like, like this from happening in the future. But my answer is that I certainly don't know, and I don't think that any of us at this point know either. And my final question, in terms of this disease, Dr. Sag mentioned that he still can't taste and smell food. You talked about the respiratory illnesses. My wife served as a COVID nurse for many months, and she'd come home with stories about the ravages of this disease. Um, why is it, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask the question, it, it has so many different effects on the human body. What is it about this virus that can ravage people so quickly and would have a death toll of over a half million Americans? It's a great question. And I think that's one of the really devastating impacts of COVID-19, that there, that it's not only spread so easily and through asymptomatic transmission, it also in some individuals will kill them. And in others who survive, even who had mild illness, it seems to impact every body system. I mean, I've treated patients who have had strokes, who have who are now on dialysis because their kidneys failed, who had gastrointestinal impacts, who now can't smell and taste, and um, and their lives are forever changed because of COVID. And of course, it's forever changed for the um, for the many individuals, the 570 plus thousand people, um, uh, 100, 570 thousand people here in the U.S. who have died from COVID and their families. I read to the statistics that somewhere between 30 and 40 thousand children are now orphaned or have lost a parent because of COVID. I mean, life is forever changed for them, and I hope that as we go forward in um, in the in this process of recovery, ideally from this virus, we also take a moment to acknowledge the, the heavy toll that it's had in our country and the world. And I would assume that also means a change in public health teaching at public universities, whether it's at GW where you teach now and, and how you try to convey to the next generation of uh, public health experts, this is what we need to do as we teach this in colleges and universities. That's right, that there is an element of never again I don't know that I feel so optimistic. I think it's not a question of if, but a question of when the next pandemic strikes. And I just hope that we will do better next time. Dr. Lena Wen, I know you have another event at two o'clock. So we wanna thank you very much. Again, a promotion of the book. It is titled Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. We can see Dr. Wen on CNN, her work available at WashingtonPost.com and what she does for the people of uh, the city of Baltimore and GW and all the other entities uh, on behalf of the Jefferson Educational Society. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. We'll turn back to Ben. That's right, a big thanks to our guest today, Dr. Lena Wen, emergency physician, public health professor, non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution, contributing columnist for the Washington Post and CNN medical analyst and author of the already out and still available How to Avoid Misdiagnoses and Unnecessary Tests and the forthcoming memoir, Lifelines, A Doctor's Journey in the Fight for Public Health. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your insights, your knowledge, your firsthand experience with us here at the Jefferson Educational Society's Global Summit 12. And of course, a big, 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 big Big thanks to Mr. Steve Scully, the chairman of the JES's Global Summit Speaker Series for moderating today's lively, thought-filled, fact-filled, great discussion with Dr. Lena Wen. And of course, thanks goes out to the entire JES team under the leadership of our president, Dr. Ferky Ferrati, to Angela Beaumont and Olivia Wickline, working behind the cameras and with the audience, to Pat Cuneo, providing critical research and copious amounts of copy, to Andy, Charles, Dia, Brad, and the rest of the JES team, and to the JES Board of Trustees under the leadership of our chairwoman, Joyce Savacchio, and to all of our event sponsors, Erie, Erie Insurance, Erie News Now, the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, WQLN Public Media, uh, the American American Tapestry Project and to the Global Summit event partner, the City Club of Cleveland. 
And of course, to all of you watching along at home, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. These programs and discussions and the exchange of information and ideas would not be possible without you. Uh, folks, for more information about the JES, including how to register for week three, the final four events of the Global Summit, please visit jeserie.org. Uh, there you'll also find videos of past presentations available to stream on demand and publications, including reports, essays, and timely writings, as well as information about other JES initiatives, such as our Civic Leadership Academy and Ramey Fellows Program. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.